Our next speaker, uh, his fun fact is he used to be a math teacher teaching pre-calculus. Are you shaking your head at me? I'm, no, no, I'm shaking my head. That is my, what you told me, well, right? It's, it's not really a fun fact. I, you <laughs> okay, give us a funner no, no, fact. No, 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 I don't no, have a No, no, it's fact. too late, Abel. You and I need to give us a funner fact. Come on. You just totally, you know, All put right, yourself I, in this position. I actually taught math in Guyana, South America. So the fun, oh. fun part is... Okay, that is a good fact. Yeah. There you go. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Abel Matthew. Okay, cool. Uh, so, quick note. I actually proposed this abstract thinking it was an hour-long talk. So uh, I'm going to try to cram as much as possible uh, into this talk. But feel free to say that I did a horrible job and that you have to follow up with me afterwards. Um, so it's really cool, actually, that we followed up after demystifying channels because a lot of what this talk about is about is kind of going deep into what a lot of people consider black magic and debuggers uh, and how they actually work. Uh, so how many of you here have worked with a, uh, like writing a compiler, writing a debugger, or anything along those lines? Just out of curiosity. Nice, three people. Uh, OK, so this talk will be pretty decent for a lot of folks then. Um, cool. And I'm sorry, you're probably tired of seeing the Backtrace logo, but I work for Backtrace, so there you go. Uh, so what are debuggers and what are they about? Um, now, when stuff goes wrong, especially in production or QA, you know, you, what are you supposed to do to actually gain insight into what's going on into your application? Now, there's a couple of answers that I see a lot, especially like in the Gopher uh, Slack room. You know, there's, log there's logging, there's pprof, uh, but those won't always work because those uh, explicitly give you, or sorry, the information that they give you is often explicit. Um, and so they're predefined. However, sometimes you want to be able to see the value of a variable. Uh, so what do you do and how do you do this? Well, I, I come from a background of C and C++. So I've been using GDB, uh, like things like Intel VTune for quite a bit of time. Uh, however, with uh, Go, there aren't such nice things to be able to get introspection to the application, at least uh, not in a production or QA environment. Uh, we have great tools like Delve, which allow me to do this stuff when I'm developing. Uh, but when you know, stuff goes wrong uh, in production, then I really want to be able to rely on something like a debugger. But what is a debugger? Uh, so now we're going to go into the magical land of dwarf and elf. Uh, why? Because to really understand a debugger, uh, it helps to understand what the output of uh, the Go compiler is and what this binary is. Uh, because a debugger will leverage uh, a binary, uh, the format it's stored in, as well as information within that, uh, to be able to uh, gain or give us a visualization of what the program is doing and the data stored there in a way that we can understand that's relatable to the source code. Now, I don't get to talk about dwarf and elf much, uh, so I decided to look it up, and this is the first thing that came up on Google. I'm just going to pause here for a second and let you guys read this, because I thought it was magical. <laughs> if you can't read the top, it says, can a dwarf and an elf have children together? Uh, the, the first response I actually think is a good joke. Uh, even larger obstacles to you Legolas raising your own little fellowship. But I love that the second response after this tries to be very uh, scientific about it. <laughs> scientific about fantasy things. Uh, and so, you know, if you didn't know, elves are kind of angelic beings, sort of like fallen angels. Elves can't even die in the same manner as humans and dwarves. I can't, I can't even read this without keeping a straight face, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so, OK, dwarves and elves, let's actually get back on subject here. Um, so when I took this example from uh, Go by Examples, uh, it's just a simple channel example. And when I actually when I build uh, this test program, what's the output? Well, it's a binary that I can run. But what is what's actually that file there? I can't open it up in Vim. I can't inspect it um, because it's not human readable text. Uh, and what it actually is is we can use a tool called Read Elf to inspect the structure of this file. Um, ELF, if you guys are using Linux, um, is the uh, chosen uh, format for the binaries. It stands for Executable and Linkable Format. 
Uh, and Linux then uses the specified structure to be able to load in this binary to be able to run it. Now, this structure will help us define things like uh, it, what the, the, sorry, the uh, system or the architecture it was running on, um, things like section headers, et cetera. And so ELF is uh, a specification. It says that certain things go in certain places within the binary. Uh, going further within this read ELF of test.go, you can see certain sections like .text, .ro data. Um, we're going to test on the .debug ones later. Uh, and if you want to read about more of what these sections store, definitely recommend that you look more into it. But we can't go into uh, that at the moment, because I've only got 20 minutes to talk. So taking this ELF binary, um, our Go source code is transformed by the compiler into machine code. Machine code literally tells the CPU what to do, and it interacts with memory. Uh, this memory can be represent, or this memory could be within registers, the CPU registers, or it could actually be system memory. Um, here on the right, I uh, actually took uh, a function that uh, is used in test.go, uh, so runtime.futex, did some disassembly, so this is the, these are the actual uh, assembly instructions as told to me by GDB, and then the register information at that point in time. So just to recap a little bit, we've got uh, our binary, which was compiled. That binary uh, has the format of known as ELF. Uh, that ELF has certain sections. Now, uh, that binary also has executable code. That executable code are CPU instructions that interact with registers in memory. Hopefully, everyone's good so far, right? So, what we really want to be able to do is take this state of the program at any given point in time. These registers, uh, the CPU instructions that are executing, and be able to somehow take it back to the original source code that was written. Um, so how do we do that, and what tool can we use to do that? Well, that's kind of where debuggers come in. And I've added an additional word now to this idea of debugger, uh, symbolic debugger. That's because when we're writing source code, what we're actually dealing with is symbols. So what we're trying to do is actually take this machine code and this uh, machine data and uh, bring it back to the symbols that we understand. So we've got the program state, which is the register in memory, um, and the executable code that's actually running. And that's an input to the debugger. Uh, now, the debugger actually needs to know how to translate or understand this machine data. And that's because this machine data could be registers, it could be memory, that you know, is you know, two gigs, three gigs. How do I interpret that data to get back to what I want to know, which is symbols, go routines, the call stack, and variables? So we need this another additional input, and that's debug information. Going back to the ELF output that I showed earlier, this brings us back to debug line, debug frame, and debug info. So what's stored within uh, these sections of the binary? Well, uh, the ELF objects contain various uh, debug-related sections, like debug line. Debug line helps us map memory addresses to line numbers. Debug info uh, helps uh, us pertain uh, type information, uh, variable information, and function information. And then debug frame helps us unwind or retrieve the call stack from a specific context. These sections um, are specified by the dwarf format. And I want to remind the audience that I'm strictly speaking about Linux right now. Um, there are various uh, other formats for debug information, as well as the binary itself, depending on the platform that you're using. So these sections on Linux are specified by the dwarf format. Uh, and so now we've kind of brought it back to the dwarf and elf. Um, I'm not sure why the specification writers chose these names. Uh, in some cases, they were trying to be cute. In other cases, it just made sense, like ELF. So now I'm going back to my test binary. Um, and I'm going back to my trusty tool, read ELF. And I want to uh, dump the debug info section. First thing I see at the top here, I, I see uh, the version, which tells me the version of Dwarf that is being used uh, according to uh, the compiler, which outputted this information, and uh, the pointer size, which we'll go into a little bit later. The other things uh, listed here are what we were talking about before, which is the type information, um, the variable information, to be able to understand this raw program state 
and get it back to the symbols that I understand, uh, me as the human, the programmer. Uh, you can see things like uh, DW tag formal parameter, uh, which is the third uh, item here, where when we go back to our program uh, that was originally done, you see a variable uh, done called here. And so we can see that there is information to be able, and I've greatly abbreviated the dwarf actually associated with this binary, but you can see that there's information to be able to map the two together. And this is not all the information that's necessary to map it. You just see references to it. OK, so I've got program state, and I've got debug information. Debug information is in, uh, specified in a format uh, known as dwarf. It's the program state is the raw program state. Um, and uh, the executable binary itself is in the ELF format. Now, this is a data flow diagram. It's not to suggest that this stuff flows into a debugger. Uh, the debugger itself actually retrieves this information. Uh, and what it outputs is go routines, the call stack, and variables, things that we understand. And because uh, we wrote the symbolic debugger, I'd like to think I'm kind of like Bob Ross in a sense that we're painting a picture of what the application is doing. Uh, and you know what it's doing is it's taking a couple colors from program state, it's taking a couple colors from debug information, mixing them together, painting some happy trees, and letting us know things like the go routine, variables, and the call stack. Apparently, I'm the only one who thought that was funny. Uh, so <laughs> I'm just going to take a quick pause, drink some water. No, no other Bob Ross fans here? Come on. <laughs> OK, yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, so, sorry, what was that? Nice, nice. OK, so literally, we're painting a picture. So what I mean by painting a picture is I want to know the call stack, which I can see on the left here. I want to know my Go routines that are running. I want to know the local variables uh, that are associated with that context. So I can think of a program as a picture or taking a snapshot of it. And I can capture things like the go routines, call stack, and variables. So how did we do this, and what was the process involved? Um, now, I, I wanted to spend uh, some of the time during this talk to actually talk about uh, how this is different from, let's say, a symbolic debugger for C or C++, or what was expected with Dwarf. But I won't be able to go into all of that information today. Uh, but first, let's talk about how we captured uh, the Go routines. So uh, I put a link down here. Um, I believe this was this first started in 2010. I'm not sure if it's still maintained. Last time I tried to use it, it wasn't working correctly. Um, however, if I want to capture all of the Go routines that are currently running, um, there's a variable called all GS, which will actually list all of the Go routines uh, in the actual program itself. So not just the ones that are running. Uh, not just the ones that are waiting, uh, all of them, even the dead, quote unquote, dead ones, which you can see right below, it actually has code to detect uh, the dead ones. This is, these are uh, GDB macros. So if I attach GDB to my Go program, I can run this macro and capture the Go routines. Um, now, let's take a step back here. This is an, something that's completely out of process, GDB, a debugger. It's attaching to the Go program. Uh, and it's using the program state and the debug information to be able to resolve the variable you know, all GS. Uh, it resolves this variable, which means that it can find that symbol and it can uh, determine its contents. Uh, by determining these contents, now I can uh, inspect that and I can do things like capture the PC, which is the program counter, which is stored in a register. So I can understand where that Go routine is currently running or where it was stopped. Um, I, can other, I can gain other information associated with this as well. Uh, so just so you have this right in your head, this is not a Go program doing this. This is a debugger attached to a Go program that's inspecting this information. So I've captured my Go routines by going through all GS, doing some filtering, capturing the PC. The PC will actually help me now gain the call stack. So call stack unwinding. Uh, how does call stack unwinding work in 30 seconds or less? Uh, there's not a really, the best way I can explain it is that uh, your call stack or the, uh, is a set of contexts uh, and a set of functions that were called that led up to a context. Each of those contexts require information to be stored. 
That information is stored into what's commonly referred to as a stack frame. Uh, those stack frames are contain, contain things like local and automatic variables, uh, the return address, so if I'm in a function, uh, where do I return after I exit that function, as well as parameters to that function. Uh, and so what happens is, is every time you call a function within a function, you're kind of growing this stack. Uh, and so to be able to uh, go back, you need to be able to reverse that process by going back uh, the return addresses. Um, and here's a small call stack from uh, something that I captured. Unfortunately, in Go, it wasn't so straightforward. I couldn't use the same uh, code that we use with C. Uh, there are a variety of different scenarios. The most notable one that kind of racked our heads a little bit was this notion of stack barriers that are inserted by the GC. Um, and so I took a little screenshot of a couple of parameter or environment variables uh, that kind of describe what stack barriers do. Uh, and it doesn't really explain the full reason behind them. Uh, and I probably can't explain that fully in detail, especially considering a lot of the Go team is here. You can easily ask them. Uh, but the way I understand it is it's a way to avoid rescanning of certain parts of the stack by the GC. Uh, so I place a stack barrier, and where I place that stack barrier actually overrides the, um, the return PC or the return address. So when I'm unwinding, I actually have to go through these multiple levels of indirection to be able to get to the original PC necessary uh, so that I can actually continue to unwind up the stack. Uh, and here's a little explanation as to what to do. So if the stack barrier BC, PC was encountered, um, I'm going to access the stack barrier, which is stored at the base of the stack frame, and restore the original PC. One thing that I forgot to mention also was that uh, these stack barriers are stored in exponentially spaced frames by default, um, but you have some options to play around with here. Uh, a quick shout out to some of the work that you guys are doing on 1.8. Uh, sounds like uh, to be able to improve the GC, uh, there's some possibility of removing these stack barriers as well. So it's a really cool opportunity to be able to use stuff like VTune, et cetera, um, by default. Uh, cool, so we've got the call stack, we've got the Go routines, now I want some variables. So how does variable resolution happen? Uh, here, that's how it happens. Uh, not really. So the, the dwarf information will contain uh, the variable information, which will contain storage, uh, information about the variable. It also contains information about the type. So here I have my dwarf attribute type, which points to a specific section of the dwarf, uh, 4808D. Here you can scan for it. Uh, I see 4808D, and I can see uh, that this is an array type. I have a name for it. I have some more information, and I continue to go on. Uh, all of these, uh, this will continue on. I can now uh, find this DW at type, which points to uh, B0, so I can go down here. And so if you think about this conceptually as a data structure, it kind of looks like a linked list where I had my type, then I point here, here's my node, and then here I point and go down, and here's my next node. Now, this is awesome, this is great. My dwarf evaluation engine, which is part of my debugger, can evaluate this, uh, take the raw memory that I have, and be able to understand this uh, specific variable. Except for the fact that we already had an existing debugger that conforms to dwarf, too. Uh, and because it was using, it detected the DW tag array type, it was actually expecting a different format for this information. So instead of a linked list, it was actually uh, expecting kind of a tree of uh, subarrange types, uh, at least according to the Dwarf 2 standard. Uh, if you were at uh, GopherCon, I did a small lightning talk about this and how this kind of tripped us up. Um, here, uh, and so going back to this uh, screenshot of Dwarf, Again, it's using version two, so that's how we knew it's using dwarf two. Just for some context, this is a small C program, multi-dimensional array, and so this is what uh, we were expecting from the dwarf information. Now, there's so much more uh, good stuff here about how to do variable resolution, especially with native Go complex types like slices, maps, interfaces. Here I actually stole a diagram from Russ Cox's uh, his blog uh, that actually explains really well interfaces um, uh, and being able to un conceptually understand them so that the debugger can understand them uh, from the dwarf information. Nice, so I've got one minute and we've got threads, we've got call stacks, we've got variables. Um, 
So this is all this good stuff. What does this actually allow us to do? Uh, and the main reason why we wrote this symbolic debugger was because with our Go stuff and with our users' Go programs, we wanted to be able to paint this picture on demand. So instead of actually having to use Delve to get this information, we wanted to have a Go program that's running out in the wild and to be able to capture this on demand when something bad was happening, or let's say when I hit a panic and I don't want to just see the call stack, I want to see variables, et cetera. So in that sense, let's go ahead and let's run something. So I'm going to run console, which is a HashiCorp program. I'm going to run it in just small agent mode. This is a Go program. Uh, and I previously compiled it, it's running, et cetera. So now I've got this debugger that we wrote. Um, we unfortunately called it ptrace, and if you're familiar with this stuff, then you know that's an unfortunate name. Um, I'm going to uh, take the PID of console. I'm going to uh, go ahead and say I want to use go, enable true. And now I've got this file, .btt file. ptrace is our symbolic debugger. So what I did was is I took console, uh, I took a snapshot of it with my symbolic debugger, and now I actually want to view this information. So I'm going to open this up in something uh, in our terminal UI, which we have built to be able to expect this files, and now I can actually see the data captured. Um, and so I also, we also capture a bunch of other information. So if it's a Go routine associated with the kernel thread, then we'll capture the kernel thread, et cetera. But what we were able to do is take the symbolic debugger and capture a point in time of the Go program. Uh, and at any point in time, it's a really awesome piece of functionality, especially when going back to that picture which we started with, stuff goes wrong. Um, and you really want to figure out what's going on instead of having to reproduce the error or just go through logging that's explicit. Cool. So uh, let's go in back here. Yep, I am. OK, so I actually prepared this talk. I wrote a really long blog. So I'm going to post this blog this weekend or early next week that goes more in depth into these issues, uh, and specifically uh, some of the things that we ran into trying to write this symbolic debugger. So definitely recommend checking that out. I'm over time. Sorry for taking more time than I was supposed to. And go enjoy your snacks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Abel. Woo!